130 years ago, the world's first serial killer earned his place in history. Today, come with Alex, Martin and me, Robin, as we brave the British weather to explore the streets where Jack the Ripper killed and mutilated five women, and got away with it. We will revisit the crime scenes and the clues. We will use them to retrace the victim's steps and build a profile of the killer. And figure out just how close the police came to catching the world's most infamous serial killer. Together, we reveal just how Jack the Ripper escaped in plain sight. Finding the places where the Ripper committed his atrocities is no easy task. The ancient streets of Whitechapel are notoriously knotted. A century of redevelopments has transformed them into even more of a maze, where old and new coexist uncomfortably. To guide us, we've enlisted historian Richard Jones. He spent over three decades walking these streets and investigating Jack the Ripper. My, my background is that uh, I started doing guided tours of London in 1982 and uh, Dickens was actually my speciality. But then as I started doing the tours, a lot of people started asking me about Jack the Ripper. So I started looking into it and I thought, you know, this is a fascinating case. Not because it's a gory case. You've got a 12-week period in 1888 where the world's media were con concentrated on a very small part of London and on the people who lived in that area. And so in so doing, they've left us a record that's our window that we can actually look at the daily lives of people in this area. And that's what got me fascinated in the case. And I've since then written three books on Jack the Ripper. I've made countless documentaries on Jack the Ripper. You've just got so many aspects in a tiny area of London, but an area that really today, if you brought someone back from that age and put them down in these streets, they would still recognize lots of the buildings around here. Victorian London was the heart of an empire that ruled over 400 million people across nearly a quarter of the globe. Turn the right corner and you will be reminded that Whitechapel was once a squalid slum. In contrast to the neighboring city of London, this was a place of poverty and disease, where 50% of children died before they turned five. In Whitechapel alone, more than 200 lodging houses were created for over 8,000 homeless or desperate people with nowhere else to go. This intense, unregulated overcrowding created a warren of streets, alleys and hidden alcoves, a breeding ground for criminal gangs. Oh yeah, violent crime was common across London. Uh, there was a huge gang problem and you had domestic abuse as well. So you have domestic murders, a lot of mothers killing babies uh, that they didn't want. And they're forever finding babies, bodies in doorways or sometimes under train seats on the underground. And from the Thames as well, the bodies be cast into the Thames. Women who had neither permanent lodgings nor secure work would often sell their bodies to survive. However, Victorian morality meant that although prostitution was not illegal, by 1888, brothels and the solicitation of sex were. Prostitutes were forced to ply their trade by walking the streets at night. These women were the prey of Jack the Ripper. Born in London, Mary Ann Nichols fell into prostitution after separating from her husband and her five children. She flitted from workhouse to lodging house and relied on charity and prostitution to survive. On the night she died, she was homeless. So obviously a lot has changed since 1888. In fact, lots of new buildings have gone up and are still going up thanks to this building site, which is obscuring the crime scene from view, unfortunately. Um, but the PC who came across the body, would he have walked this street? He'd have walked this very street. Just before the large building there yeah. was a gateway and that's where the body was located. If he walked down here, the one thing he would recognise today would be that large build, the sports school. It looms spectre-like over the crime scene. And of course, the way the streets changed since then is uh, the old buildings have gone. Quite Just on really. that yeah. side, you had a line of houses. Over the murder site, in fact, you had a place called New Cottage and that's where Mrs Emma Green and her family lived. And yeah. she was actually in a bedroom, sleeping in bed, overlooking the murder scene. Oh, really? And yet she heard nothing. And she said she was a light sleeper. She had heart problems and she was a light sleeper. And then directly opposite where the scaffolding is, was uh, Essex Wharf. 
uh, and on the first floor level there was uh, Walter Perkis and his family. Uh, and again, they, 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 they'd seen nothing and uh, his wife had been up at the time of the murder, she thought, and yet she'd heard nothing at all. So the murder had done it in complete silence and complete quietude. When the police arrived, they found the body. Where, where the large building's at the end, just in front of that was a gateway. And there on the ground was lying the body of Mary Nichols. Now the first police officer on the scene was PC Neal. And what PC Neal saw was the throat had been cut. So they sent for Dr. Llewellyn, who turned up on the scene. He pronounced life extinct, but only did a very cursory examination. And this is the interesting thing about this body. Within one hour of that body being found, it was taken on a police ambulance, which was little more than a wheelbarrow or a handcart, and was wheeled off to the local mortuary. So within an hour of the body being found, they've cleared the body from the site, washed away all the blood. So all the evidence is gone, if there was any at the crime scene. But it was at the mortuary that the big discovery was made, because uh, Inspector Spratling turned up about, about a little while later. And he went into the mortuary and lifted up the skirts, as is of his description and when he lifted up the skirts he found something that everybody had missed beneath the bloodstained clothing there was a deep gash all the way along her abdomen she'd been disemboweled uh, and that was the start of the sequence of crimes that we now know as the Jack the Ripper crimes. Uh, so Richard what I wanted to ask is about uh, the victim herself Mary Nichols. Mary. Where whereabouts in this area was she last seen alive? She was last seen alive at the junction of Osborne Street and Whitechapel Road. She actually met Emily Holland uh, at the corner, it's about an hour and 20 or an hour and a half before her body was discovered. Right. And she boasted that she'd made the lodging house money several times over, but she'd spent it all. And she was now going to try and make it one last time. Now, Emily was a bit concerned because she seemed very drunk. And she said, right. well, why don't you just come back with me and sit in the kitchen and sober up? Yeah. And Mary said, no, I'll, I'll get the money make sure they keep the bed and off she went. As for the movements from that point on, we don't know anything more about her until Charles Cross walked down Bucks Row where we're standing and in the gateway up there found her body. What probably happened was that um, Mary Nichols probably solicited the, her killer. The important point is that it wasn't the murderer who chose the locations, it was the victims because they knew the places where they weren't going to be interrupted, the places that were perfectly safe. So consequently, she would have brought him here because this was a dark, it was a dark street. And of course, by the time she came to realise the nature of the, the client she got, it was far too late. Uh, but it's illustrative of just how quick it must have been because none of the people heard anything. The honest truth is, and the one certainty about Jack the Ripper, is nothing certain because we don't know who Jack the Ripper was. So, exactly. so what can we learn about the murderer from Marianne Nichols' death? Sadly, very little. Witnesses heard and saw nothing. This means we cannot even be sure her killer was a man. On the other hand, the silence of the crime tells us the killer was careful and methodical. Before she was in Whitechapel, Annie Chapman lived in Windsor with her husband and three children. A difficult life and drinking problems drove them apart. She supplemented her income by working as a prostitute. Chapman lived in Crossingham's lodging house on Dorset Street. She was killed fewer than five minutes walk from her home, which means Jack might have been coming from the opposite direction when Chapman bumped into him. So we're now in Hanbury Street, and this is where the second Jack the Ripper murder took place. So round about here was number 29 Hanbury Street, and it was a, a residential property. Lots of people lived in it, families lived in it. The fact that they were transient as well meant the door stayed open almost 24 hours a day. It was often used by the homeless people who would go and sleep in there. Annie Chapman was homeless that night. She may well have just gone into the building. We do know she was seen alive at 5.30 on the pavement outside by a witness who walked past and sort of talking with a man. So that establishes the fact that this murder took place between 5.30 and 6 in the morning. But at 6 o'clock in the morning, John Davis, who was an elderly resident of the building, he came downstairs, went into the backyard, and as he opened the door, he saw the body lying on the ground between the steps and the fence. Moments later, three gentlemen were in the street outside, and out of the doorway came bursting this wild-eyed old man who said, men, come quick, and they saw the body of Annie Chapman. And for a moment, they were dumbfounded, and then they sprang into action. One went for a drink, he was so shocked by what he saw, but the others went off to try and find the police and bring the police to the scene of the second Jack the Ripper murder. So did the response to this particular crime differ from the first uh, victim? What did happen was Inspector Chandler, who was the first detective on the case, he did give instructions that nobody else was to be allowed into the building, so he did seal the scene. Dr George Baxter Phillips, who was a divisional police surgeon, was the one brought to the scene. Now he, because it was in a private backyard, they could seal the building off and he was able to do a much more thorough examination of the body. So the difference was that the mutilations were discovered at the scene of the crime, as opposed to in the previous case, they weren't discovered until the, the body was taken to the mortuary. 
So Richard, what can we learn about the killer from this particular crime? You said there was a witness. Did we get any kind of uh, witness descriptions of what he looked like? Uh, firstly, the witness who saw him was about half an hour before the body was discovered. So she didn't see the man's face. Uh, he had his back to her, but she did overhear the conversation. He heard the man say to the woman, will you? And the woman said yes. From that brief overheard snippet of conversation, she just he was a foreigner. What we now know is he, he then goes into the building, into the backyard, and at any moment, anybody could have come downstairs, walked into the backyard and discovered him. And yet, he calculatedly mutilates the body, removes the womb. I mean, he went off with the womb in this case, and then steps out into a street that's busy, a busy street. We're in a busy street now. And uh, yeah, he steps out, and he's not noticed. So he obviously blended in. That's one one point about him. The other one was he was a risk taker. He was must have been cool, calculating, and at the same time lucky. At this point, did the police know that they had a serial killer on their hands? Or was that a kind of new concept yeah. at that, that uh, point in time? Police never used the term serial killer. The term yeah. serial killer wasn't around. The repeat murderer was, 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 was a, yeah, a repeat murderer was another. The Jack the Ripper file, or the Jack the Ripper murders, we believe there were five victims. Mm. But the Whitechapel murders file, which is the generic file, has 11 victims on it. Yeah. So there were murders before Mary Nichols and the murders after Mary Nichols. So the police certainly thought at least one of those murders Possibly by this time, they think the, uh, another murder in April, Emma Smith, was also by the same hand. Mm. So consequently, they realise they're looking for a repeat killer. Uh, and uh, so they're getting the nature of what they're after and what they're dealing with. Uh, but the problem is they haven't really got the means to deal with it. And to be honest, would they have the means to deal with it today? If, if big problem is he left no clues behind. The inquest was held in the Working Lads Institute, which opened in 1885. The building is still standing on Whitechapel Road. It was here that the man who examined Chapman's body, Dr. George Baxter Phillips, identified the murder weapon as a thin, narrow blade, such as an instrument a medical man would use for post-mortem purposes. The second murder gives us a lot more information about Jack the Ripper. Annie Chapman was seen with a man merely feet from where she was murdered, half an hour before her body was found. We can therefore conclude this man was probably her killer. We also know he killed Chapman merely yards from many potential witnesses, just before they all woke up for work. He killed Marianne Nichols in the open street, therefore he was willing to take risks. The witness described him wearing a dark overcoat and a deerstalker hat and said he had a foreign accent. And in order to walk away without raising suspicion, he must have been calm and calculating. The doctor at the inquest also believed he had some basic anatomical knowledge, like a doctor or a butcher. Jack's next victim was Elizabeth Stride, who had been a prostitute since before she moved to London from Sweden in 1866. Her English husband died in 1884, and she sold her body to supplement her income from house cleaning. On the 29th of September, she left her lodging house at 7pm. She was next seen at 11pm outside the Bricklayer's Arms pub. Then she was seen with several different men up and down Burner Street for the next couple of hours. So where are we now, Richard? Well, this is the scene, almost, of the third murder. This is now Henrique Street, but it was Burner Street. And a little way up here on the left was a yard, and that yard was called Dutfield's Yard. And it was in this yard at one o'clock in the morning that a man named Louis Deemschutz, who was the steward of a club that used to stand next to the yard, yeah. he came in here with his pony and cart. This is where Deemschutz turned his cart into the yard, and as he did so, the horse or the pony shied and pulled left something had disturbed it. So Deemschutz looked down and he saw something lying in the yard, so he jumped down to get a better view. And looking down, he found the body of Elizabeth Stride, who was the third victim of Jack the Ripper. Now what's interesting is that Deemschutz could well be the man who almost caught Jack the Ripper. No because way. what the police came to believe was that when he first came into the yard, yeah. the Ripper was in the process of committing the mutilations. And when he came into the yard, he interrupted. And so the Ripper jumped back into the shadows. And it was that sudden movement that startled the pony. Remember, it shied and pulled left. If the Ripper was still there and he had been interrupted, yeah. then Deemschutz certainly came closer than anybody to catching the Ripper. This is the third murder. So this is the first one that Jack's done really out of sight. It, well, it's almost out of sight, but in a way it isn't either, because yeah. there's a witness to this, true, uh, yeah, almost to this <laughs> murder, and that's Israel Schwartz, who comes walking down here about quarter to one in the morning yeah. and sees a man and a woman arguing in the, that very gateway. Yeah. And uh, as he watched, the man sort of spins the woman around, throws her to the ground, so he right. didn't want to get involved. So he crossed over the road to avoid them. We don't, we don't know for certain that the person he saw was the Ripper. But what we do know is that 
her body was found in the yard 15 minutes later. Now, for two attacks to take place on the same woman in the space of just 15 minutes, it, it's almost too much of a coincidence. Yeah. And he could have used lots, because there's lots of narrow alleyways, streets, passages around here. Any one of the passageways would have led him in that direction. And that's the only certainty we have. He went that way because 45 minutes later, a second body was found in Mitre Square. This has become known as the double event, two murders in one night. Uniquely, this is the one occasion on which we can trace Jack's movements with some certainty. He must have run from Dutfield's yard to Mitre Square, where he killed his next victim, Catherine Eddowes. Eddowes was born in Wolverhampton, in the English Midlands. She left her first husband and three children because of her alcoholism. Half an hour before she died, she was released from Bishopsgate Police Station, having been arrested for drunkenness. Eddowes was last seen alive at the entrance of Church Passage leading into Mitre Square. She was talking quietly with a man. Ten minutes later, she was dead. We know she went from Bishopsgate Police Station down Houndsditch. She was possibly heading towards St. Botolph's Church, a gathering spot for prostitutes. Is this where she met Jack? Perhaps, knowing prostitutes were likely to be gathered there, he went straight to the church from Hanbury Street to find another victim. So we're in the city of London and we've come into Mitre Square. And in fact, uh, it's in this corner of Mitre Square that the body of Catherine Eddowes was found at 1.45 in the morning on the 30th of September, 1888. She's the fourth victim of Jack the Ripper. Uh, significantly, she's murdered in the city of London. Uh, and the city of London haven't had their own police force. So oh, right. this is going to bring a second police force into the investigation. But Catherine's of an interest because um, just outside the, uh, one of the passages over here, about 15 minutes before her body was discovered, three gentlemen came out of a club on Duke's Place out there and they saw Catherine chatting with a man outside the entrance of the square. And one of those men, Joseph Lavender, took a clear look at the man's face. Now, interestingly, he didn't see the woman's face because the woman had a back to him. But when he was shown Catherine's clothes in the mortuary, he was emphatic, those were the clothes the woman had been wearing. Uh, the man, uh, he was able to describe him. So he said he's about, uh, he's 30, uh, around about 30. He said he was of a fresh complexion. He had a sort of a, a, a moustache uh, and the overall appearance of a foreign, of a sailor. Uh, so that was his interesting. Uh, so he may well have seen Jack the Ripper. But then it gets frustrating because he, he maintained that he would never be able to identify the man if he saw him again. When the police arrived, probably within a couple of minutes of the murder taking place, the Ripper's headed off in that direction. Within a few minutes, the police are on his trail. They've gone into the streets because they're going into the streets and they're sweeping through the streets. And yet again, he wasn't caught. And that suggests that it was someone from the area because the traditional image of him in the top hat, the cape, he would have stuck out like a sore thumb in that area Absolutely. when he went that way. When he went that way, he went that way because he fitted in. That's where he lived. That's where he felt secure. He was going to ground. And so it suggests somebody who lived in the east end of London. So you say that two police forces were brought in on this yeah. particular investigation. What kind of impact did that have on trying to catch Jack the Ripper or finding out exactly who it was. Probably increased the chances of catching him because since the 1830s they've had their own police force uh, and their job is to police the one square mile of the city of London. Now up until that point it was the Metropolitan Police who were in charge of the investigation. The significance of the Metropolitan Police is that they came under the jurisdiction of the Home Office and the Home Office had refused to do something that was causing huge controversy at the time. They would not offer a reward for information. When they came into the City of London, the City, the Lord Mayor of the City offered a reward. So rewards start getting offered. What it does is it proves that rewards would have made no difference whatsoever because despite the fact they've got almost £500 in rewards on offer now, no information came forward that led to the apprehension of the Jack the Ripper, which again suggests he was a lone killer. Had he been in with a gang of local criminals with that sort of money on the table, someone would have turned on him event, uh, at, that, at that point. No honour amongst thieves. No, no, kind of no, thing. no yeah, honour yeah. amongst thieves, but yeah. no, nobody did. Personally, I just think he was lucky. He knew what he was doing. By this time, he's got his confidence. He commits the murder. He knows that the police are on the way. He knows that these streets are going to soon be the search of a massive hunt for him. So he's off into the, into the back streets, suggesting that he knew the back streets. He knew the area. Maybe he's a delivery person by day, and he, he gets to know the streets in that way. Uh, and he's walking past these courtyards, or he, maybe they're a shortcut for him when he goes to and from the work or from the markets in the area. So he can commit his murders. And then if he's dodging in and out of these passageways, uh, going between the police, because the police are searching for him, but the important thing is they don't know who they're searching for. And given the fact you've got something like 60 or so butchers and slaughterhouses, you've got people in those streets who are walking around in blood same clothing all night long. So, uh, oh, so uh, if Jack was covered in blood, covered in, if he's covered in blood, he would just look he, like he, anybody he, else. He, he, he looked like a slaughterman in the area. 
So, Richard, tell us, why are we standing outside a fish and chip shop? <laughs> this is where Jack the Ripper left his only clue behind. Uh, it wasn't a fish and chip shop when Jack the Ripper left the clue. Uh, it was a block of apartments, uh, and these were the Wentworth model dwellings. What had happened was, he'd had the murder in Mitre Square, which is over in that direction, the murder of Catherine Eddowes. There was a piece of Catherine Eddowes' apron was missing, and Alfred Long, uh, a little bit after, was passing this doorway when he saw something lying in the doorway. And it was that piece of apron. And it had bloody fingerprints over it, and the blade of a knife had been wiped on it. And that's Jack the Ripper's clue. And it's a clue because it tells us, firstly, where he's heading. He's coming from that direction, but he's coming this way. So we know he's coming into the east end of London. Secondly, it answers the very important question, how much blood did he have on himself? Because obviously what he's using here is he's cleaning off the blood from his hands. So consequently, it probably means he wouldn't have had much blood because the evidence suggests he asphyxiated his victims first. And so you're not going to get the arterial spurt when he cuts the throat. You're just going to get the blood on his hands. So with this, he's got a dark doorway. He steps into the doorway, wipes his hands, wipes his knife, drops the apron and heads off somewhere into this area. But the doorway had something else in it as well because as long stood up, scrawled on the wall in chalk, was a message which read something like, different people remember different things, the Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. Uh, and when the Metropolitan Police saw that, they were horrified because they thought the next morning, six o'clock that morning, there was going to be the Petticoat Lane Market around here and the stalls here were run by predominantly Jewish tradesmen. So they were terrified. That message was on the wall when the dawn came, then it would be seen by the Gentiles and that would lead to anti-Semitic unrest in the area. So consequently, the police rubbed it out from the wall and it was a hugely controversial uh, order. It was given by Sir Charles Warren, the head of the Metropolitan Police. He was the highest ranking officer at the scene message erased uh, and that's because he erased it it's been the source of endless conspiracy theories in the river was it because it was a masonic message was it something he recognized probability is it was just coincidence the apron was the clue the graffiti was just something that was there already. So we don't know that the graffiti was written by Jack the Ripper no, himself? We, we, we don't. And some officers just saw it said that it looked faded, as though it had been there for some time. Oh, OK. Yeah. okay. And, and honest truth is, this, this is the graffiti people remember, but racist graffiti was going up all over the area sure, sure. Uh, in the wake of the murders and relating to the murders. This was just one bit of graffiti. It just happened yeah. to be found at the same yeah, spot yeah. As, yeah. The, as the apron. Exactly. Okay. Had he dropped the apron in that doorway? probably wouldn't remember the graffiti here today okay, but the fact he did it in that doorway where someone had already scrawled the message we remember that so really what we've learned from this mainly is where the killer was going and how much blood he had on his apron yeah. and he liked fish and chips and he liked, and he liked fish and chips <laughs> speaking of i think it's time for lunch i think it's a good idea though. <laughs> the bloody apron found on galston street proves Jack was heading back into the heart of Whitechapel. He was probably heading home, not far from where most of his victims lived. The double event strongly suggests Jack was an opportunistic killer. He very probably lived in Whitechapel. He acted alone. A police constable who saw Elizabeth Stride near Dutfield's yard said she was with a man wearing a dark overcoat and a deerstalker hat, had a small moustache, and was about 28 years old. Witness Israel Schwartz said he had a small moustache, wore a dark jacket and a peaked cap, and was about 30 years old. The witnesses who saw Jack with Catherine Eddowes also said he was about 30 years old, had a small moustache and a peaked cap. They said he looked like a sailor. With all this information and several close calls, let's examine why the police failed to catch Jack. The Metropolitan Police had 5,000 men to patrol the streets at night, but those 5,000 had to guard a city of five and a half million people. Though they came close to catching Jack red-handed several times, luck and Jack's superior knowledge of the local streets meant he was always able to outrun the constables on his heels. Many detectives were put on the case, but not enough to review all of the evidence gathered by over 2,000 police interviews, let alone with the hundreds of hoax letters sent to newspapers claiming to be from Jack the Ripper. Indeed, his nickname comes from a letter that was almost certainly a prank by a journalist. As for forensic evidence, police procedure had the bad habit of clearing up and cleaning a murder victim's body before a proper examination could take place. This was mainly because curious crowds would gather to gawp at the crime scene and disturb the investigation. But crime scene photography was in its infancy. Detectives had no opportunity to properly search for small but significant clues. Moreover, Jack didn't leave any obvious clues behind. Fingerprinting began in 1901, and DNA profiling wasn't invented until the 1980s. The police were also not investigating just these five crimes. 
They were investigating 11 murders in Whitechapel, some of which we now know were not Jack's work. Nevertheless, the police were unwittingly pouring their limited resources into chasing many murderers, and not just Jack. In summary, there were not enough police constables who didn't know Whitechapel well enough, and forensic criminal investigation was not advanced enough to detect the tiny clues left by Jack. On the other hand, the increase in police patrols of Whitechapel after the fourth murder may explain why over a month went by before Jack struck again. So this is Commercial Street, and uh, on Commercial Street in 1888, about this point here, was a street called Dorset Street. And Dorset Street was often referred to as the worst street in London. It had a population that was made up of uh, people who were criminally inclined. But a little way up on the right-hand side was an archway, and that led into, or that was, Miller's Court. And it was in there, in a room, number 13, lived Mary Kelly, and she's the last victim of Jack the Ripper. The police would never have had a chance to interrupt this particular crime because it happened in her room, didn't it? Exactly, yeah, yeah. But there was no chance of the, uh, the, well, the police coming across the crime scene. In fact, no chance of anyone interrupting, unless, of course, someone perchance dropped by to say hello or whatever. But aside from that, no. And that's probably why the mutilations were so horrific as well, because he can take his time. There's no danger of interruption, so he's got all the time in the world, whereas at all the other murder sites, he's got to be away quickly, because he knows any moment a policeman on his beat is going to come past. But here, no one's going to go past. And in a way, this is the crime that really earns him the nickname. Yeah. This, this is the crime where you see the full horror. It's the only one of the victims who was photographed at the scene of the crime. Yeah. And you just look at that photograph, and even with all the things we're used to, all the things we have, even looking at that black and white photograph today, it's shocking. Where was she last seen alive? And what, around what time do we think that the last sighting is in the early hours of the morning of the 9th of November 1888. She's seen on Commercial Street out here. She's seen by a man named George Hutchinson. Hutchinson had been out to Romford Market. He'd come back. He evidently knew Mary Kelly because as she walked past him, she said, Hutchinson, then there's a tanner, sixpence. And he said, now, nah, spent out at Romford Market. She said, well, I'll just have to find it some other way, won't I? And she continued down the road where a man coming from the opposite direction tapped her on the shoulder. And she turned to look at the man. They said something, started laughing. She then took the man's arm and led him back down Commercial Street and into Miller's Court. And there's a pub over there called the Queen's Head. And he says, they walked past there. He looked under the rim of the man's hat as he came past and sort of looked quite sinister. Hutchinson said he was suspicious, so he followed them into Dorset Street, and then he stood opposite Miller's Court for about 45 minutes. Nothing happened, so he went home to bed. But as far as we know, that's the last time that Mary Kelly was seen alive. Richard, do we think that this was the last Jack the Ripper murder? It's interesting because we, we honestly can't say with any degree of certainty how many victims Jack the Ripper had because we don't know who Jack the Ripper was. So for that reason, we can't say, like we don't know who he was, we can't say how many victims he had as well. If this, as many people think, was the last Jack the Ripper murder, the thing we learn is something happened to the killer after this murder. Uh, serial killers such as this don't get fed up and think, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do something else now. And with Jack the Ripper, if this was the last crime, something happened to stop him killing. One possibility is that he went somewhere else and carried on killing and they never made the connection. That's unlikely. Another possibility is that he died, maybe from his own hand, maybe from natural causes. Another possibility is that he was lived with his relatives who realised something was wrong with him and put him into an asylum. Because yeah. another possibility is he was picked up for another crime, locked up for that crime, and they never made the connection about who they'd got. If this was the last murder, we can certainly say that something happened to the killer after this murder. As with so many things, we can't say for certain. Witness George Hutchinson's description of Jack may be too good to be true, but the basic details, a dark coat, dark hair and a small moustache, and possibly Jewish, match previous witness statements. Mary Kelly suffered the most horrific mutilations of all Jack's victims. She was skinned down to the bone, her heart was missing and even her face was cut off. Kelly's death marks the climax and the end of Jack's killing spree. After all their investigations, who did the police suspect was Jack the Ripper? Well, perhaps unsurprisingly, they did not agree. In 1894, Chief Constable Sir Melville McNaughton wrote a private memo naming three men as the chief suspects of the Metropolitan Police. The names he listed were Michael Ostrog, M.J. Druitt, and Kosminski. Kosminski was also the favoured suspect of Chief Inspector Donald Swanson. However, Inspector Frederick Aberline preferred a fourth suspect called George Chapman. Martin sat down with Richard to discuss whether the police had caught the right scent or were barking up the wrong tree. 
So Richard, we're here in the Ten Bells pub in the heart of Whitechapel where the Jack the Ripper killings took place. It seems likely that his victims, and maybe even Jack himself, frequented this exact place. So... Huge possibility. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, if we're looking at the suspects, the first one that comes to mind is Montague John Druitt. Montague John Druitt was a barrister turned schoolmaster, and at some stage towards the end of 1888, he committed suicide by throwing himself into the River Thames. That would have been it, except for the fact that he then turns up on a list of suspects in 1894 by Melvin McNaughton, who was one of the high-ranking police officers at that time. McNaughton said that he had private information uh, that Montague John Drew was Jack the Ripper, but he doesn't say what that private information was. It has to be said that McNaughton, with virtually everything he says about his suspect and about Druitt, he gets wrong. So he obviously didn't know that much about Druitt. So the second suspect I'd like to put forward is George Chapman. I know that Inspector Aberline thought that he was potentially a suspect um, in the Jack the Ripper murders. Um, is there any evidence for this? George Chapman was the f apparently the favourite suspect of Inspector Aberline. Now, Aberline's important because he led the on-the-ground investigation into the crimes in the area. Now. Chapman, when he was brought to justice, he was a wife poisoner. And Aberline seems to have thought that anybody who could watch his wives die from slow poison was wicked enough to be Jack the Ripper. I see. Well, wicked enough, maybe, but we are talking different types of crime here. It's uh, very different, isn't it, from, different from, the, from the crimes we've seen? Yeah. So it seems fairly unlikely that the George Chapman was, in fact, Jack the Ripper. So Ch Chapman, pr pr probably not, although because of what Aberline says about him, he does have to be taken seriously. So what do you think about Michael Ostrog? I know he was a local thief and con man in the area around the time of the killings. Do you think that there's any evidence for him being Jack the Ripper? Ostrog's interesting because, he, 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 as far as we can tell, and we do have in the newspapers, he's extensively mentioned in the newspapers from 1860 onwards, he's a con man and a petty thief. And, and it has to be said, as a con man and a, a thief, he wasn't a very good one. But he had this habit that whenever he felt he was going to go to prison, he would feign insanity. And he seems to have succeeded, succeeded in that in 1887. And he got himself put into an asylum and was released in March 1888. Now, he had in the past said that he was a doctor. Uh, so he had claimed to be a doctor on several occasions. And when the police were looking into who Jack the Ripper might have been, they started thinking he had medical knowledge and were looking for recently released people with medical knowledge who'd come out of the asylums. And it might have been the fact that he'd come out of the asylum, that he said he was a doctor, that meant that the police, he got caught up in that police tr uh, trawl to find Jack the Ripper. But again, I have to say, that what we know about him, he's certainly not the sort of person who would carry out this type of murder. And if he did, he'd get caught easily. So the last suspect Richard would like to look into is Aaron Kosminski. Can you tell us about him and whether he was likely to have been Jack the Ripper himself? Uh, Kosminski's one of the more intriguing, he, because he's, he's a suspect that's mentioned by at least three police officers. Uh, two of them mention him by name, one of them mentions him by uh, in, in insinuation. Uh, the one who mentioned by insinuation is uh, Sir Robert Anderson. Now he was the head of the CID, the Criminal Investigation Department at Scotland Yard. So he was the highest ranking officer with direct responsibility for the Jack the Ripper case. And he wrote his memoirs in 1910. And he says in those memoirs, unsolved murders are rare in London and the crimes known as the Jack the Ripper murders do not fall into this category. In saying that he was a low-born Polish Jew living in the heart of the area, I am stating an ascertained fact. He also says there was a witness who saw the murderer who identified uh, this suspect, but he doesn't name the suspect. Now, what he did was he gave a copy of his memoirs to Chief Inspector Swanson, and Swanson was the officer who was given the task very early on of assessing all the information that was coming in from the on-the-ground police. So Swanson knew everything about the case, and Swanson got a copy of these memoirs, and that copy turned up again in the 1980s, and he's actually put a name to, an, uh, uh, to Anderson's suspect, and that name is Kosminski. And there's only one Kosminski who fits that bill, and that's Aaron Kosminski, who he then goes to leaves an asylum, and he dies there in 1919. So if they thought that he was more of a suspect than any of the others, then he has to be high up on the list of people who could have been Jack the Ripper. The problem is that as far as we can see in the records, we don't have the records 100% yet, he's not, a, he, he's not particularly homicidal. The violence he's involved in is throwing a chair at somebody. And the only other crime he's picked up for around about the time of the Ripon murders was having an unmuzzled dog on the streets of London. So uh, again, it's interesting. It'd be wonderful to have their, in, their information, the evidence they had against him. But then again, they were the high-ranking officers. If they thought he was the Ripper, he has to be high up there on the list.
So with Kuzminski dying 100 years ago this year and the files being released about his, his, his records, um, do you think any new information will come to light? I don't think anything new will come out of the records, to be honest. Uh, I, I think we'll be as, at the end of this year, we'll still be as in the dark as we were at the beginning of this year, as we were 100 years ago. So I don't think the, the files are going to reveal anything that's unknown to us. Uh, and I think uh, it's, it's interesting, but uh, I don't think they'll reveal anything. So some DNA evidence came to light in 2014 relating to Kosminski. I mean, what can we say about this? The DNA evidence is interesting. It's, it's a shawl that we don't even know that it was Catherine Edo's shawl uh, that was reputedly taken away by a Metropolitan Police officer from a City of London police murder. His sergeant gave him permission to take the shawl away and that evidence supposedly then had on it evident the DNA of Aaron Kosminski and Catherine Edo's. The only problem with it is that uh, the science has been disproved. The tests were done wrongly, one thing. But even then, the shawl's unlikely because we do know the city police did a minute uh, crime scene investigation, right down to they detailed every item of clothing, everything that was on that body in the square, and it was effectively bagged and taken away. They would not have let somebody, and certainly not a Metropolitan Police officer, take a piece of evidence away from a City of London police crime. Uh, that wouldn't have happened. We don't even know if the shawl was Catherine O's shawl. It's, 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 it's long been in the family. Uh, supposedly this policeman took it over for his wife so that she could do some needlework or something with it. Uh, the newspapers picked it up and hyped it. We've caught Jack the Ripper at last. Uh, but the problem with any theory on Jack the Ripper is the moment you start digging into the theory and not doing just lazy journalism that's a good headline saying Jack the Ripper caught at last, the moment you start digging all the arguments start falling apart and the evidence falls apart and it did in this case and it's, uh, it's discredited now it has to be said. We now have a compelling portrait of Jack the Ripper. He was around 30 years old, had a small moustache and wore a peaked or deerstalker hat and a dark coat. He was probably foreign, maybe Jewish. He clearly knew his way around internal organs. Given he almost certainly lived in Whitechapel, he may have been one of the many local butchers. He was opportunistic and willing to take great risks. He targeted his victims because they were women in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was a violent, psychopathic loner who enjoyed mutilation. The police never caught him because Jack was too clever. He didn't leave clues that couldn't be found without modern forensic methods. He knew how to blend into the crowd and used his knowledge of the labyrinthine streets to escape the law. Quite why Jack stopped his murders, we will never know. But we can say with certainty that the five women who fell victim to his savage desires were also victims of abject poverty and a broken society. What made these murders different was the, the newspaper coverage, because the newspapers very early on learned that these murders could tell newspapers. It's the old newspaper saying, if it bleeds, it leads. They really ramped that up and made the murders sensational. And in so doing, they managed to turn five sword East End murders into what would become an international phenomenon, and ultimately what created the legend of Jack the Ripper.